Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. My name is Nicole Siegel, and I am the Senior Education Communications Manager at Third Way. We're delighted to have you join us today for a conversation with Dr. Zakia Smith-Ellis, newly appointed Chief Policy Advisor to New Jersey Governor Phil Murphy. This marks the fifth conversation in a series of conversations the Third Way Education team has been hosting virtually, where we've been engaging influencers and thought leaders in the conversations happening around higher education and the federal response to coronavirus. The previous conversations with Congresswoman Donna Shalala, President of UMBC, Dr. Freeman Hrabowski, Angie Kiefler, strategic consultant and pollster, and most recently, higher education journalists from NPR, The Washington Post, and The Chronicle of Higher Ed are all available to view on our website. In the last couple of weeks, students, faculty, administrators, support staff, families, local and state leadership, and countless other relevant stakeholders have begun the ultimate juggling act welcoming students back to class for the fall semester while maintaining everyone's health and safety in the middle of an unprecedented global pandemic. There is no question back to school looks very different this year for students of all ages across the country. And while no sector of our nation's education system is immune to the impacts of COVID-19, our colleges and universities have been hit particularly hard. For many institutions of higher ed, especially public schools, CARES Act emergency relief funding just scratches the surface of what they need to survive. And states already stretched thin by the pandemic are still struggling to close that gap. So how are state leaders responding to increased financial need from public university systems? What guidance are they providing to colleges around their fall reopening plans to keep students and faculty safe? and what's missing from the federal response. Today, we're so thrilled to go behind the scenes with Dr. Smith Ellis to dig into these questions and more and learn how New Jersey state government has been working to support its higher ed institutions in response to coronavirus. Before we, before we formally kick things off, just a few logistical details regarding today's run of show. First, the hope is for everyone on today's call to have the opportunity to ask questions, which you can do using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. I'll go through a few of the questions that I've prepared first, and then leave plenty of time at the end for audience Q&A. I also want to note that this conversation is on the record and is being recorded. So if there are things you miss or will want to reference again, you will be able to do so at a link posted later on to Third Way's website. So without further delay, let me introduce our esteemed guest. Dr. Smith Ellis is a little over one month into her new post as Chief Policy Advisor to New Jersey's Governor Phil Murphy. This position will allow her to continue doing critical work, building a stronger and fairer New Jersey, work she's already been deeply involved in for the last two and a half years in her role as the state's Secretary of Higher Education, where she's been at the helm of leading the state's coronavirus emergency response for students and the colleges and universities they attend since early March. Prior to joining the governor's office, she previously led work at the Lumina Foundation, the nation's largest foundation focused solely on higher education to advance federal policy to increase attainment and develop new post-secondary finance models focusing on issues of affordability. Prior to her work in philanthropy, Dr. Smith Ellis served as a senior advisor for education on the White House Domestic Policy Council, where she was tasked with developing, informing, and promoting President Obama's higher education policy. She also served in the Obama administration as a senior advisor at the US Department of Education, where she developed programmatic policy and budgetary solutions to pressing challenges in college access, affordability, and completion. So as you can see, there are few better equipped to have this conversation. Dr. Smith Ellis, thank you so much for joining us today for this timely conversation. Well, thanks for having me. Um, we're thrilled to have you here. Um, and I know you're very busy, so I want to be respectful of your time. Let's jump right in. If we have learned one thing in the last few months, it's that when we make plans, COVID-19 laughs. And we've seen this play out time and again as colleges and universities have shifted their fall reopening plans. New Jersey unveiled guidance for institutions interested in reopening in-person classes back in June, 
and then as recently as last week issued updated guidance allowing schools to reopen virtually if they can demonstrate reopening in person is not safe. What are some of the most significant elements of the reopening framework you've provided to schools and how might we see these guidelines continue to shift in the coming weeks? So um, it's been quite a journey and there's def definitely a difference between um, the K-12 side, which is, um, it's really interesting because in K-12, I think uh, we have a lot of schools and I'll focus on higher ed because that's the topic of our you know, time today. But I just will say for context, um, if you notice in K-12, there's a lot of concern about students going back. Um, and in higher ed, there's a lot of push. There was until you know some of the UNC stuff yesterday. There was a, and some of the other colleges, but there was a lot of push um, to to be more in person. And I would say that's actually um, in some ways counter to what we know is best from some of the public health stuff. And um, when we look at international experts, and I've read a lot of um, uh, international studies of uh, how people have reopened schools and higher ed, and everybody basically says that you should start with younger students first. It's maybe a little counterintuitive counterintuitive, but something about um, older adults, those over the age of 10, suggest that we spread the virus more. As we can see, sometimes maybe it's just compliance. We don't, we know, we don't know a lot, but um, there's a lot of reason to be uh, concerned about older people rather than younger uh, people. For instance, many states have had child care facilities open. We have had child care facilities open for essential workers and haven't seen um, that be a, a huge problem. They're very limited, it has to be groups of 10 and cohorts. Um, but so that just gives us some thought about kind of the context for each. Having said that, um, I think we were one of, from what I could tell when I was still in the role of secretary, one of the few states that actually um, did a statewide executive order um, banning in-person instruction back in March at colleges and universities. So we really were in a place where unless you got a waiver from what was then my office, the office of the secretary, you could not um, reopen um, for courses at colleges and universities unless you explicitly sought out a waiver. So that executive order banning in-person instruction was in place until the June executive order. So we've really had a statewide approach. I know a lot of states have left it individual institution to institution, but we've really had a statewide approach of saying, um, and I think because New Jersey's been, been hit so hard, we've needed to say statewide, here's what the parameters are. You can certainly have flexibility beyond those overarching parameters, but we need to have some overarching parameters. So getting to those, um, we, our guidance was uh, phased. So there was a phased approach, uh, depending on where we were as a, a state. Um, there were some things that are universal throughout any phase, even if we're kind of at the maximum level of flexibility, everybody still needs to be masked. Um, so we have a universal statewide masking requirement that also applies to classes and kind of anytime you're in a common area at institutions of higher education. Um, for students who are immunocompromised or otherwise uncomfortable, needing to allow them some other option other than in-person instruction to continue their education. So that was a key feature. Um, limiting residential uh, life. We didn't say explicitly how much or how little because there's so many different types of residential experiences. But one thing that we said across the board was that as part of your reopening plan, you had to have space for quarantine and isolation because as we see now, one thing that you can definitely predict is that there will be students who um, get COVID and that the institution itself needed to have space set aside for students um, who would need to quarantine or isolate. So um, that had to be part of any institution's reopening plan, which also leads me to every institution had to have a reopening plan submitted to the state before it could reopen. So that reopening plan had to follow a template from our guidance um, that showed how are you going to uh, prepare for social distancing. How, what is your plan for um, residence halls? There were 10 different areas. What is your plan for um, student services? There's so many areas of um, institutional life. Obviously, there's the in-person in-class experience, but then all of these other things, research labs, athletics. And so um, that, that guidance outlined, I won't go through in detail. If you want to go to the website, you can see through all, but the major things um, were that you had to have a plan. It had to follow this phased approach. And um, you had to have universal masking, obviously, like lots of cleaning. And that plan had to be available to the campus community at least um, 14 days before you plan to reopen. So for families, students, others, they needed to, we want, we believe that a big part of this is communication and for institutions to share, not just with the student community, but with the faculty, with the staff, other folks need to be able to see what are the plans for 
um, how I'm going to be safe in this space if I'm going to be asked to come back. Thank you. Um, very complicated. And yes, as you referenced, I think we're, we're, starting, we're starting to see um, how many variables they are, there are um, in schools reopening and how that's been playing out kind of most recently in the news yesterday, we saw um, UNC Chapel Hill. Um, as schools in New Jersey, whether fully virtual or a hybrid or in-person have started to, to reopen, what are some examples of innovation that you've seen them employ as they work to kick off kind of the fall semester while still keeping their, their students and, and staff healthy and safe? Yeah, so one of the things um, that was part of the, uh, well, two things that were part of the reopening guidance that I saw some interesting models for institutions. Um, one was that we required screening. You need to have a plan for screening. It's frankly, testing every student isn't really recommended. Um, you have to, because the test is a one-time thing. It may be something that in certain instances where students are uh, residential or living together, you may wanna do uh, more often than not, but testing every student more frequently is going to be one, very expensive and in, in terms of just frankly, statewide testing resources. Um, we have 500,000 college students in the state of New Jersey, plus faculty and staff and others. Um, even as we ramp up our testing, um, what our priority has been has been kind of the most vulnerable populations, those in long-term care facilities, obviously those in healthcare um, settings, those who are frontline workers, those, those who are healthcare workers. So um, students are certainly somebody that we, that we care about, but if there's not kind of a more um, a reason to think that there's a situation there, we can't really think seriously about testing them 500,000 students every week or something of that right. nature. So um, screening though is incredibly important. So screening for symptoms, we know it doesn't get at asymptomatic folks, but you can screen for have you been in a COVID hotspot? New Jersey has a travel, uh, it's crazy that we're in this place, but New Jersey has a travel ban. Um, so we kind of, the governor jokes, if we could have a wall around New Jersey, we were in such a bad place before and we have lowered our um, numbers of people who have COVID and, and infection rates so dramatically. But in order for us to keep it that way, we really have to think about where are the hot spots. And so right now the hot spots are in a lot of other states in the Sun Belt and the South. And so if you're coming from those places, you do need to isolate um, for 14 days when coming to New Jersey. That's what we're, we're um, saying right now. So if you've been to a hot spot, that would be one reason that you wanna be screened or maybe tested. Um, or if you've been around somebody that is known to have COVID, we want to you know, know that that's a screening for maybe when you need to be tested. And then certainly if you are showing symptoms, you certainly need to be screened. So the question is, how do you, how do you find that out? How do you do that screening? So one really interesting um, thing that we saw in a plan was before you could access the university's Wi-Fi, you would have to answer those questions. Have you been to a COVID oh, have you, genius. And so that you could get a kind of, um, and, and then if so, wow. here's what you need to do. Mm -hmm. um, another thing, and that we're seeing a lot of what's happening is really behavioral and you need to change people's behavior about how they interact and just what's the norm. Even if you have the appropriate safeguards within a classroom, how do you ensure that students, um, faculty, staff, others on campus, but just generally, how do you ensure that people know what the new norms are and are kind of educated about them in a way that causes them to change behavior? So there, um, I wouldn't, I don't know if it's unique to us, but as part of our reopening guidelines, we said that everybody needs to have a, or a COVID orientation plan. So in the same way that you come to campus and you're oriented about, here's where your campus mail is or whatever, um, you need to have an orientation that goes mm. through, here's how COVID is spread. Here is what you need to be doing to protect yourself and others. Um, here's the expectations for you when you come to campus. And again, um, that needs to be integrated in part of your reopening plan as an institution. And it needs to be something that you're seriously thinking about, not just having these rules, but making sure that people understand why they're in place. For sure. Thank you. Um, as courses have moved online, it's become even more apparent how broadband inequality and access to technology impacts educational opportunity. Earlier this summer, Governor Murphy released a very comprehensive plan to address New Jersey's digital divide in the K-12 system for the 2021 academic year. Talk a little bit about what the state is doing to help close the same divide for students um, enrolled in New Jersey's higher education system. Yeah, here um, 
we did something that I'm not sure any other state did. Um, and that was that we used the entirety of our governor's education, um, emergency education relief funding through the CARES Act for higher education institutions. Um, and what we had done earlier in the year, right around the time that we were at the height of the pandemic, was we had asked institutions to just have an, a sense of their financial impact. We have heard, you know, anecdotally, there were a lot of refunds, that there was, a, you know, they were just having to, to um, there were lots of revenues that they weren't getting, which was causing a financial hit. The state also deappropriated funding for higher education realistically, so that also caused an impact. And then there was the planning for the future of like cleaning facilities, um, making sure that you had enough PPE for those on campus who were still there or who were, you were planning <clears throat> to have come back. And so, um, and there were just a bunch of needs, laptop rentals, um, co connectivity for those who didn't have them. And so all of those were eligible uses of funding for our gear funds. And so what we did was that um, 68 plus million dollars that we got um, through our governor's fund, we allowed institutions of higher education to use for whether it was um, closing the digital divide, it's very flexible. They just have to show how they would use it. And that funding was provided on the basis of um, what has become the, the, the new normal for us in New Jersey in terms of how we give out any funding that we have at the state level, uh, which is a mix of equity measures. So it's overall enrollment. We use headcount and not FTE. Um, overall enrollment, um, a low income student enrollment with Pell as a proxy and um, the number of underrepresented minorities uh, in your institution. So we really think that's a good way to kind of look at institutions need um, based on the student population that they're serving. Yeah, thank you. Um, so as you just mentioned, um, Governor Murphy allocated all of the CARES emergency relief funding to New Jersey to the state's higher education institutions. Um, and yet, sadly, still, that combined with the nearly $14 billion in federal stimulus funds um, from Congress that have been sent to institutions across the country, um, it comes up short. So as the federal government looks to offer additional support to the higher education sector to rebuild in the coming months, what are, what are the greatest financial needs you see uh, that both students and the entire campus community really, really need? Yeah, I mean, so students have some of this. I'll start with students. Um, I always start with students. Um, yes. They have, uh, this has been what one of our state economists called a, a, a low income recession. So it's disproportionately hit those who are um, working class, disproportionately hit those who are Black and Latino, um, disproportionately hit those who are hourly um, wage workers. And so, and what we've seen actually in our revenue numbers is that in general, um, those who are doing very well are fine. I mean, if you think about it, for New Jersey anyway, that's like people on Wall Street and financial services. They can work from home and they can still do their jobs. The people who are really struggling are those who were, uh, you know, working in restaurants, those who were um, working in, you know, stores and malls. Those are the folks who, for an extended period of time, didn't have any work. And we, um, as a nation, we had, you know, unemployment that just lapsed and Congress has decided that it is not going to do anything about that in the near term, just allowing those folks to not get um, the uh, pandemic unemployment relief. And so that's where we're seeing both in the general population, but then you think about students. And again, the students who are most in need are community college students. That oh, there's overlap there. So where are you know, some of the neediest students are those who were um, working on campus in jobs uh, that, you know, aren't campus jobs anymore, or they were working off campus and some of those hourly, they were working at a restaurant, they were working in other places that have significantly reduced their hours or don't need as many people. Um, and so um, initially, um, we had taken, uh, I mean, we took steps certainly to make sure that people had access to their unemployment. We've had to really staff up our unemployment insurance, um, making sure that people knew that students were available. To the extent possible, we asked institutions to continue to pay federal uh, work study workers, which I think was consistent with what um, federal guidance said, but also if they had student workers um, to think about prioritizing their CARES Act um, money toward them. I should say, in talking to a lot of other SHEOs initially as well, um, some of the things like this where you're you're trying to respond to a myriad of problems that are not all things that are necessarily within 
the purview of the state higher education office, there's still enormous value in giving institutions guidance from guidance. It's not mandatory, but just saying, here's what you should be doing. Mm -hmm. um, there's enormous value in doing that, especially at a time when we're going through something that no one has ever dealt with before. So to say, you should be paying your student workers in priority. You should be trying to pay people, even if we're not like mandated or coming after you or arresting you for not doing it. Um, there were, so a lot of the early on guidance, um, you know, we saying, you know, when people were closing down their dorms for safety reasons, you're saying you should prioritize those students who don't have anywhere else to go. You right. should keep campus spaces open and provide food for those who, and here's how you do it safely. To the extent that you want to do that and you want to do the right thing, we're going to provide you information and guidance about how to do that in a standardized way well, because what we heard from a lot of campus administrators was like, oh my God, this came out of, for them, again, came out of nowhere. We don't know what to do. We want to do the right thing. And having a state agency or someone with some amount of authority to say, um, here's a roadmap for how you can do these things well has been, I think, really important. So that's another area where we know that the, some of these students have been hit hardest. We said this, um, it ties back to the question about the digital divide in higher education. Early on, when people went remote, we were saying here, you know, you should consider doing a laptop rental program. Even at the time we didn't have funding, we were saying you should consider doing a laptop rental program. You should consider, re, you know, prioritizing these students um, for X, Y, and Z. So um, that's something that has carried through in the guidance for reopening as well. Um, and then for institutions that are uh, most in need, as I mentioned, our priorities for how we're giving out the funding really tries to give more funding to institutions that serve students who are more in need and then um, using the headcount measure, which I think as of late um, has been a source of contention at the federal level, but just trying to recognize that even part-time students, um, not even part-time students, but part-time students are students and we need to think about that. Yeah, thank you. Um, in June, under your leadership as uh, former New Jersey Secretary of Higher Ed, and in partnership with the New Jersey President's Council, Council, which represents presidents of 56 public and private two and four year colleges and universities across the state. You published an incredibly powerful statement on combating systemic racism and fostering inclusive communities. New Jersey's institutions of higher ed rank among the most diverse in the country and the statement represents the system's commitment to being equal and just and to provide all students access to higher education. What will this work look like in the 2021 academic year? And relatedly, what role do you think institutions of higher education play in advancing civil rights? Well, thank you for noticing that. Sometimes you put out statements and you don't know if anybody's <laughs> Um, and that one, I think, was really led by the presidents, which I appreciated. And they really wanted to, to the point about what does this look like? We had a lot of conversation before we put it out about we don't want to just have another statement. This actually needs to lead to something different on college campuses. Um, one specific thing that was part of the statement and that the institutions who signed on really um, understood is important in doing this work is that it has to engage not just um, students of color and particularly, you know, engaging white students in the work of addressing uh, racism on campuses. And so if it was kind of a mutual commitment that anything that's done is going to be done is going to be something that is inclusive of the entire campus community, but doesn't put the onus of trying to figure this out or fix this on the students of color, but really acknowledges that it is um, white students who have to really be part of that conversation as active and you know uh, affirmative participants and institutions in that work need to recognize that when they're thinking about what does programming look like and how does that how does that happen um it, we also talked about when we were doing this institution's role frankly not just in addressing um inequities and racism within colleges but their role in perpetuating racism in the broader community and having a role to play as kind of systems in society that could, if not run well or not, you know, if there's not an intentional focus, could perpetuate inequality and perpetuate racism rather than um, really uh, advancing civil rights. And so the conversation again is not just about like well, how do we increase diversity on our campus but it's about what are we imbuing in our students so that when they go out into the world they are different 
people and there, there are individuals who are able to be anti-racist in their interactions. Um, that's not easy work, um, and it's certainly not easy work given the stress that colleges are under in this current time. It's probably work that's best done in person, and it's difficult to do many things in person right now. And so, um, you know, in some ways, the outlines that I just mentioned, we know we need to do. We need to include white students. We need to have a broad, you know, constituency of who this is engaging. And the focus needs to be not just on how are we thinking about this as it relates to our institutions, but how are we thinking about this as it relates to students and their role outside of the college. And not just students, but um, colleges as anchor institutions. We have a college that just opened the campus in Atlantic City, which is incredibly kind of depressed as a community. Um, what is that college's role in that broader community? And what are the state, like, Anytime somebody, if you're in a community like this, and you know that if you're not part of the college community, there's always a perception of those who are part of the college community. So recognizing the faculty, the staff, the interactions when they order pizza, um, just how is the college showing up in a place? Um, and I will say we've had the one Princeton, which is um, you know the richest college in New Jersey, um, has been a fantastic partner in thinking more about how they can be a better partner with the state of New Jersey used to joke that Princeton um, who kind of hide the fact in previous years that they were in New Jersey is like, yes, Princeton is not just in the world, it's in the state of New Jersey, right? So what are you doing for students in Trenton who's just down the road? It's the closest city, closest major city to Princeton, New Jersey. Um, and Trenton and Princeton couldn't be more different. How does Princeton show up um, in helping? Um, and how do people in, again, New Jersey think about Princeton? So they have some really great plans on that front, but it's, it has to be bigger than just like, how do we increase diversity at our campus? Thank you. Um, so I'm going to pick one more question from my batch and then move to a question from the audience. So folks on the line, please feel free to start submitting questions. Um, so switching gears a bit, I would be remiss if I didn't ask you about the Community College Opportunity Grant Program. I had the opportunity to chat with you back in early fall of, I think, 2018 when New Jersey had just launched the program that would serve as the state's first tuition-free college program. Nearly two years later, how's the program doing? Are there metrics of success or impact that you can share with us? Yeah, so um, thanks for asking about that. One of the things um, with all of the budget challenges that we've had as a state, I should start there, um, we did preserve the Community College Opportunity Grant Program and um, we have our, our revised state budget is actually due a week from today. So uh, when you say there's a lot going on, there's definitely a lot going on in the state. But one of the commitments the governor made back when we realized just how big our budget deficit was, and it is uh, quite large, it was initially $10 billion over um, about an 18 month period. And just for scale and size, I know a lot of people in this audience may be used to you know, trillions of dollars now at the federal level, but for a state um, the size of New Jersey, our budget annually is somewhere around 38 and 39 billion dollars. So to have a $10 billion budget deficit over the course of like about 18 months, as I mentioned, is quite just astronomical. Even within that though, we've said that we will try to fill this hole as much as possible by preserving programs that serve um, the media students. And I would put um, financial aid for low-income students top on that list, the CC. OG, our free community college program is um, need-based. So it's for students making, uh, from families earning less than $65,000. And again, for context, the median family income in the state of New Jersey is about $80,000. So we're not even like at the medium for the mm -hmm. state. This is really for low-income students in New Jersey. Um, it, uh, and it covers their tuition and fees. Also in New Jersey, um, low-income students didn't have their community college costs covered already. Some of our, we have a variety of of tuition prices, it's not set at the state level. So some may be as low as $2,500. Some might be as high as $6,000, depending on your community college. So this was a program that really did help um, students. What we saw was actually that the majority of those who took advantage of the program were actually um, working, well, I wouldn't say working, but adults. So who are usually working. So I would say working adults. Um, we saw that a number, um, when we just looked at the data, it wasn't just, uh, and we, we structured the program intentionally in this way to benefit not only those who were coming straight from high school, but very much so to have a message to those who were kind of out in, you know, working in the world to say, if you are working and you want to come back to community college, 
Um, CCOG does not have an age limit. It doesn't say that you had to be restricted from recently graduating from high school. Um, it is in nature an adult promise program. We don't need to have, there are things that we need to do to support adults separately, but we don't need to have a separate adult promise program because it is a core part of what um, our initial commitment in terms of tuition free community college mm -hmm. means to residents and students in New Jersey or would be students in New Jersey. And we've seen that that population had really taken up CCOG, um, you know, like I said, more than more than um, even the kind of traditional uh, aged or, you know, younger college students. So that's um, something that has been uh, really great for us to see. I think the other part of it that is more anecdotal than a kind of fact in that way has right. been um, our program had a, um, a commitment to the community college's operating costs. So in addition to the grant to students for their tuition to be covered, um, it also had a component of $5 million in grants to our 18 colleges and universities, our, our 18 community colleges across the state to give them at least $250,000 each to help support operation of the program. So whether that's outreach, whether it's signs on buses, it was um, signs in malls, any place where you might be able to let students know about the benefit. Because one of the things is, the reason you would do a program like this is so that people know that it's there. Right now, even I just, and it's also based on, I, I realize my internet browsing patterns are, are not the same as everyone else's, but I get when I'm browsing um, ads for, you know, the local community college online, you know, just saying, did you know that, the, you know, do you earn less than $65,000? You know, you may be able to go to um, community college tuition free in the state, click here for more. So I know that as we gear up for the fall, that they've been continuing to do um, advertising. I got a mailer in the mail um, which, for my local community college as well. So that's been very, um, I think an important part that we've seen, again, anecdotally be successful is supporting the institutions with dedicated funds to carry out the program. Sure. Thank you. Okay, let's move to some audience questions. Um, we've seen state standards and guidelines for institutions of higher education to open for in-person instruction. Does New Jersey have, and should other states have, statewide standards for when an institution should close, as did most recently, as of yesterday, UNC? And of what level of outbreak is too much? Or do you think this should be left to individual institutions of higher education to decide? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, we have said that, um, so we haven't set in place for higher ed specific, um, you know, thresholds to say when you have to close as an institution. We did just do that for K-12, however. Um, if needed, we can, we can extend those to higher education and I would, um, just say for the K-12 um, guidance that we put out that I think is relevant here, we actually did our regional risk matrix. So to say, one thing that we know is if coronavirus is spreading within your community, it's likely that it's going to be spreading wherever you are, especially in schools. So mm -hmm. um, if it's, you know, if you're in New Brunswick, which is where Rutgers is, and we have a, corona, a COVID outbreak in the greater New Brunswick area, it's likely that it's going to hit uh, Rutgers as well. Maybe that's not the best example because it's such a large school that it's likely sure. that it starts at Rutgers and then spreads. But you could have a smaller college like a Bloomfield College, which is in North Jersey. And if we saw in Essex County and the counties that surround in that North Jersey, New York region, if that started, if we had seen coronavirus, if we saw coronavirus start to spread there, we would be more concerned, for instance, even if we saw more symptoms, like just symptoms, we were waiting on the test, but we saw, okay, this week, we know that there's been an increase in this region, which we know from our contact tracing, we're able to say um, where this is. If you started to see one, two, three cases there, it may be more reason con for concern than if you kind of saw one, two, three cases in another region where there's not a lot of community spread. Um, and so one thing that the epidemiologists have really told us is that it's contextual. You don't know if it's like, you know, three people all went to North Carolina and all came back, in which case those three people and the people that they were, you know, around need to be contained, but it's probably mm -hmm. not a broader issue versus three independent people who don't have any connection with one another, all tested positive in this area, and we're seeing a broader community spread. At that point, you're like, okay, we need to shut this down because this is probably going to get out of hand if we don't do something. And knowing the, that there's difference in those fact patterns is something that um, has to be part of it. So um, having said that, our, I will pivot back to our K-12 guidance, which is in any case, so you want to look at the kind of levels of regional risk. If you're 
again, interested in just how that looks for New Jersey. That's now on our, um, our state COVID website. Um, and it breaks the state up into six different regions. We're a small state, but there's still regionalized trends um, with low, medium, high, and very high. Basically, if you're ever in the very high place, we say as a, as a, a, a school, you probably should be doing um, remote learning. Um, mm -hmm. We say probably because especially with K-12, there's some like special education classes and others that really can't be done remotely. And so we just are thinking about appropriate safeguards to have those done in person. But for higher ed, and I would say it's K-12 as well, one thing that we definitely know is anytime there's any case, you have to um, close, it, it, wherever that person spent a significant amount of time, which is usually 10 to 15 minutes, you close that area, close it for 24 hours and clean it. So at some point, if you have a bunch of cases, you just get to an untenable place where you have so many areas closed that you're probably gonna need to close. But the other piece is that if you have two or more cases, an outbreak as we define it in New Jersey is you have two or more cases that are epidemiologically linked. So um, there's a reason to think that they got it from one another. And if you start seeing that within a college, it could be a very low number. And then you're, you're noticing that you have an mm -hmm. outbreak in the area. So to the numbers that I saw yesterday from UNC where you're talking about over 100 is like crazy town. I mean, that's like, yeah, you, you definitely yep. have an issue. I would yeah. say, even though we didn't have a hard and fast, if you're seeing something like, like five linked cases within classes, within clusters, that's a, a sign of alarm. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Uh, jumping to the federal level, um, thinking about the fact that the Trump administration has rolled back a lot of the important higher ed protections you helped put in place during the Obama administration. What actions are you hoping to see if we have a Biden-Harris administration come January 2021? And are there key executive actions Biden could take in higher ed that would make uh, your job easier at the state level? Well, for one, um, and I think I saw a preview of another question around immigration, just if we could just stop with the assault on, on students who are immigrants and immigrants in general, that would be extremely helpful because uh, we really are a state that's extraordinarily diverse. We have a lot of um, students who, whose parents are immigrants, who are immigrants themselves, and we really value them. We think that they add to the fabric of our, um, our educational community. We provide not only in-state tuition, but in-state financial aid, uh, financial aid, state financial aid to undocumented students. So um, just the assault in general on undocumented students and then not just undocumented, but there's been now a move to have an assault on um, what I would say is an assault on, on immigrant um, students. So to see that end would just, our, our lives, I would, what I would say is over the past several months, our lives have been extraordinarily difficult already in dealing with the public health crisis and dealing with them, the economic crisis, both for individuals and institutions. So that on top of that, have to deal with ridiculous rules around trying to shut out um, students who really contribute to the fabric of our colleges has been stressful. Our attorney general um, sued the administration for some of those rules. And so that just takes time and energy that's just better used on kind of supporting students rather than trying to kick them out. So um, knowing that that will not be, uh, we won't have to fight that back will be good. Um, I, obviously there's also a lot of challenges with um, students who've been defrauded by their institutions. Um, and so to, we've been thinking at this, again, at the state level, we've uh, filed, uh, our attorney general filed a lawsuit um, uh, around uh, gainful employment and just trying to get that implemented in the way that it was supposed to be. And that's something I spent a lot of time on prior to. Uh, but to just know that we are actually going to go after bad actors and, and folks who are really leaving students high and dry um, would take a lot of the pressure off of us at, a, at the state level to try to figure out how to remedy some of those federal pieces. Yeah, thank you. Okay, we've got about four minutes left, so I'm going to try to squeeze in two more questions. Um, one a little bit more substantive and then a lighter one. Um, so this moment, these crises that we are um, currently experiencing are likely to be a pivot point for higher education and so many other things, and will likely change the way the industry works even after the pandemic is over. What opportunities do you see um, for us being able to use this moment to create a more equitable system moving forward? Um, I think, I, what I would hope is that we have renewed attention to just 
the needs of those students who are what I would say um, most in need. I would hope that given the disproportionate impact of this crisis, like I said earlier, it's, it's really laid bare the inequities that were in our system. So I would hope that it causes us to try doubly as hard, come back as, as an example. When, um, as I mentioned this earlier, but I'll mention it again. When we talk about residential life and those colleges that do have do dorms and the ones that, you know, initially shut down and ask students to leave, we ask colleges to think about, well, what about those students who don't have any place to go, who may be homeless, for whom the, the college is their home, um, that you should keep your, you, you should keep some kind of on-campus presence um, for those students in particular. Um, that's something that we've kind of carried through to reopening as we did our phases to say, when you're thinking about how to prioritize campus housing, you should prioritize not necessarily those who can get their deposits in first or who mm -hmm. you know, pays the biz biggest amount, but why don't you think about prioritizing those for whom, but for campus housing, they won't have another place to stay. Prioritize those for, but for being able to eat in campus um, and use their meal plan, which is paid for by financial aid, may not have a meal. And so that's something that doesn't necessarily have to be the case just in the middle of a pandemic, mm -hmm. but that's something that you could think about as an institution to say, could we have this kind of priority moving forward for campus housing? Again, not just a first come first serve or whoever pays the biggest check or whoever does the, but to say, let's, we're gonna do the room priority that always has to be done every year based on who is most in need. Hmm. And they've now come up with across all of our colleges, different ways to determine the need of their college, of their students um, for, for different aspects. Yeah, that's smart. Um, so I think we can all agree the news is really heavy these days, and I'd love to end on a little bit of a lighter note. What is something giving you hope right now in New Jersey? It does not have to be higher ed related. <laughs> um, I will say, as since, from, since moving from um, uh, D.C. to New Jersey, just over the past, it, it's been not just now, I mean, I think COVID is just like, oh my God, maybe the straw that broke the camel's back in terms mm -hmm. of uh, frustration um, with the new administration and just a lot of the things that have been happening. Um, but in this period prior to COVID where we were hit really hard in New Jersey, I would say a lot of things here were, you know, whether higher ed or more broad, um, really giving me hope. It's a generally a place that is very progressive. We have progressive values and we're holding to those. Um, so I would say just the, even though it's difficult and this is definitely a difficult time, I think um, a lot of the innovation that, that is happening and it has happened in different states gives me hope. The fact that I know we can have, um, even though we're gonna have to make painful decisions in the budget, the fact that like, our legislature, our advocacy community here, and others are asking us, how are we going to prioritize those who have the highest need? The fact that we spent our coronavirus relief funds, we've been able to spend it on programs that disproportionately impact um, Black and Latinx communities in the state of New Jersey. We've given um, $65 million in rental assistance to those who haven't been able to pay. We've been able to um, do things like halt evictions, all evictions across the state, and no one has said, oh, I think that's not a, you know, a good thing to do. I think the fact that, that there are communities, and so I think when folks kind of get down about things, just to know that even in the midst of some really terrible situations, we're protecting, in many places, we're aiming to protect those who are most in need. And the, again, every time we roll out even $5 million of coronavirus relief funds, or if we do a digital divide program that's giving you know, K-12 students laptops and hotspots, um, that gives me hope to, to know that in a very bleak situation, we're finding ways to do whatever we can to prioritize those who are most in need. That that is kind of something, and and that we're not. It's not a fight. I would say here in New Jersey, right. when we're doing those things, it's like legislative leaders, others coming together and saying, "Yes, we found a way to overcome this hurdle together and collectively." That's what we're sure. Um, Dr. Zakia Smith Ellis, thank you so, so much for joining us today and carving out time for this timely conversation when I know you have a very packed schedule. Um, be well and stay safe and healthy. Um, and much, much luck. We're excited to see all that you all that you do for the state of New Jersey in your new role as Chief Policy Advisor. Thank you. Take thanks care. Thank you so much. Time. And thanks to you all for joining us this morning. Bye bye.